Welcome to Strip Cover Lit. I'm Dalton Gentry, and this is a new segment that we've been kind of toying around with the idea of doing. Uh, as a lot of you know, very recently I decided to go to grad school. Therefore, Adrian and his constant level of production, you know, got a hold of me and he's like, why don't you film a segment once a week about what you're learning in grad school? So this is that. Uh, let me premise by saying first and foremost that obviously I'm not on the strip cover lit set. I am in my dining room. Therefore, I don't know how the sound and video and lighting and all that good jazz is going to look. But this is week one, so we're going to test it a little bit. So, week one of grad school. And yes, very low key, I can smoke in here. Uh, what we've been discussing is I'm taking the class History of the English Language. This is for graduate credit, beginning of my grad school career. Uh, the book that we are using this year is This Language, A River. Uh, this is History of English by K. Aaron Smith and Susan M. Kim. And basically what I'm going to try to do every week is just sit down and kind of cover the basics of what I've been talking about. I will be doing a research project this semester, so hopefully I'll be able to discuss a little bit about what I'm researching, how that's going, what I'm finding out. Uh, and hopefully this is vaguely interesting to anyone who's involved in linguistics. I like linguistics. It's, it's kind of a weird field. It combines a lot of history, uh, a lot of uh, socioeconomical things that are going on in the area. Uh, it, there's a lot that has to be combined to develop a language. So, where'd we start this week? Uh, we discussed the basics, trying to get everybody basically back on track and what to expect this semester. Uh, that would include the Internet, International Phonetic Alphabet, that's a must-know thing there, uh, and basic grammar usage, because in order to successfully determine how a language has evolved over time, you have to pick up on these very minute changes in the language and these changes are usually my dog is having a sneezing fit i apologize if you can hear that uh these languages change very subtly so in order to better identify these you need to know the grammar the complete grammar structure of the language and how the uh, sounds the voiced and voiceless changes change over time and the best way to do that is with the international phonetic alphabet so if you've never actually looked into that it is very interesting uh, it'll give you a difference between how you spell cat and how you spell cat, just as an example. Uh, beyond that, we did a little bit of the philosophy of language. Basically, what sentences mean, what language means, how we derive our meaning from a language. Uh, it, it, it's very thought-provoking stuff. Basically, uh, one of the questions I was given that I had to write a little bit of a, a personal essay on was, when referring to a thing, is what is referenced in the mind of the referrer? So, basically what we're talking about there is, like, if I am referencing something, uh, is what I am thinking of given to you when I am trying to speak? It's not really the word I was looking for. Can I project what I'm thinking of in my mind completely and accurately to you. And I would argue, no, absolutely not. There are way too many things that can go wrong in a language. And it could not be wrong. I mean, misinterpretations are a thing. Uh, but let's say I say book. What you think of a book may not be what I am thinking of as a book. You may have automatically gone to this copy of This Language of River, because that's just happened to be the book that I mentioned. You may be thinking about a book that you're recently reading, but no matter how finite I get in my example of what is a book, I'll never be able to project exactly what's in my mind into yours. And I believe this is a post-structural view of how language works. Uh, I read into a little bit of structuralism and post-structuralism, and it's pretty heavy stuff. I'm not sure if I've got an exact grasp of it yet, but hopefully that is to come. That's why we're taking classes. Uh, but basically, the post-structural view of things, from what I understand, is language is so complex that there is no way, because any time that I say, like, book to you, another signifier is going to come into your mind. I could say the blue book. That doesn't really distinguish it. What shade of blue are we talking? Uh, is blue the same to me? Is blue the, sa is the same to you? Uh, this book is uh, exactly uh, eight inches uh, wide. It, it, although that's it is pretty finite there, I mean, is that an exact measurement? Is this, because I'm picturing it in my mind, 
Basically, as the signifiers progress, it just becomes more and more complex. Therefore, at no point in time can I project exactly upon you what is in my mind. But that's also the interesting thing in language here, is I can also express very complex, abstract thoughts, although very poorly right now, I would imagine, uh, to you, and you can get an understanding of what I'm trying to get at. And that's the beautiful thing about language, is like we are able to communicate between one another. Uh, and, and rather successfully, I might add. And in order to do that, it, it requires uh, an unimaginable level of thought uh, to be able to take these arbitrary words and symbols and noises that I've forged together and create them into a realized, structured thought. Uh, it, there's a lot of processes going on there, and we just talked a little bit about philosophy and language, things along those lines. Uh, now, what is to come? Obviously, we're going to start with early language. I think we're going to start Anglo-Saxon era and how that language has progressed over time. And I'm really excited because at one point we did review a poem called Wolf and Ed Wasser. Ed Wasser. Not sure how to say that still, but maybe we'll get there soon. And that is an old English poem that's found in the Exeter book, which is, I, I want to say, around the 9th or 10th century AD. Uh, and it, it is one of the earliest forms of written poetry we have available, I think. Uh, but that poem has obviously changed over time. It was written in Old English. It's been transcribed over the years into modern English. Uh, and it is still, no one really knows what it's about, if it's a riddle, if it's a poem. And I find things like that very interesting, and I'm hoping maybe I can incorporate that into my research project this year. Uh, however, that's really all I have. This is just kind of an intro to this segment, as this week was an intro to my classes. And hopefully I learn a little bit along the way. Hopefully I can share a little bit of what I'm learning with you. I do think we have some readings coming up, which I will probably be sure to post on Twitter, Instagram, something. Uh, so if somebody is very interested in the history of language and linguistics, uh, they'd be able to read along with us. And hopefully, I don't know, gain a little knowledge about how this uh, weird English language has come to be. Uh, I also think it's very interesting that a lot of our viewers speak multiple languages. English might not be their native tongue. Uh, so this would be an even more different approach to how language works. Uh, but anyway, I am Dalton Gentry. This is Back to School with Dalton, a new segment that we're going to be having throughout the rest of the semester and hopefully throughout the next uh, next few years, if everyone seems to be enjoying this. Uh, you can always follow us on Twitter, at Stripped Cover, and myself, I am at the Dalton on Twitter. You can also follow our Instagram. And if you are so inclined to help us create more content like this, there is a link, as always, to our Patreon in the scripted edit in the description below.